Okay, so I'm in a slightly unique position of uh, creating and producing citizen science projects without being the scientist involved um, or running the research. I, I do have an environmental science degree, but I'm at the ABC and I've been creating citizen science projects for many years as part of the ABC's kind of shebang around Science Week. Um, and the projects I've produced have been focused on engaging large numbers of people um, in an online environment. And to do this, I've worked with numerous scientists, research organisations, and to achieve different um, goals. The projects are funded by Inspiring Australia, and they've run each year during Science Week as a way to provide an opportunity for anyone in Australia to engage in Science Week. So as long as you've got an internet connection, you can get involved. And the inspiration for each of the project comes from a different way. Um, sometimes I'll put a call out, often I'll put a call out to people, and other times I just think of an idea and I'll approach research scientists to see if they can come on board with it. Um, I've been responsible for producing the science, so liaising with the scientists and to work out the scientific goals, working with designers and developers, and working out a way to just maximise the engagement. Before we did these, we used to do interactive projects. One of them was a great belly button survey with Dr. Carl, which actually won an Ig Nobel Award. And we've done games as well, like Catchment Detox. But once we started doing citizen science projects, we just realised the engagement was so high. As everybody here knows, people love citizen science projects. And the feedback we got was amazing. So here's a bit of a brief introduction to some of the projects from the last few years. Um, this is Explore the Seafloor, which we did in 2013 with the University of Tassie and IMOS. And there were two, um, I'm just checking the time, two separate projects with that. You could help with looking at kelp. They were, these were photos taken by robotic vehicles of the seafloor. They both had different mechanisms for the way that you worked. Helping with kelp was a grid that people clicked. Spotting sea urchins was just clicking on the sea urchins that you could see. Weather Detective we did in 2014, and you'll notice that there are more people involved, 10,000, almost 11,000 now. Um, and this was with the University of Southern Queensland working with an international group called ACA, where they get weather observations out of old ship logs um, this was specifically this crazy guy called Clement Ragg who was very passionate about getting observations from sea captains so he gave them all these specific sea logs for them to log details and they're all just in a, um, a library or a museum, I can't remember exactly, but we had a huge number done and they went into an international database. In 2015, we did Galaxy Explorer. Um, again, the number of people went up, and I also worked out the number of hours. It was 23,000 hours, 23, hours done by the citizen scientists, which was some kind of, you know, I can't even remember exactly. I did work it out, but maybe eight years of a research assistant's time. It was a massive help to the team at ICRA, um, and it was basically people just looked at these photos of galaxies from the other side of the universe. People, sometimes people, no one had ever seen them before. So there was an amazing kind of discoverability factor and it was very exciting. Um, and the great news about that project is it's actually being funded again through the Inspiring Australia Round and we're going to have a new Galaxy Explorer coming up later this year. Wildlife Spotter we did in 2016 with the Australian Museum and six other research institutions. You could dip into six different projects from all around, well, almost all around Australia. Sorry, WA, but we didn't get there this, this time. Um, and yeah, it was phenomenally popular. We had 50,000 plus people involved, 30,000 hours, just slightly rounding that up. So these projects were all partly successful because they had the might of the ABC behind them, but only partly, and I'll talk about that a little bit more lately. And because this session is about good design to creating great outcomes, I just wanted to talk briefly about some of the key things I think is important to designing a really great citizen science project, or at least one for an online environment. Um, so it's, citizen science is citizens plus science. It's about doing science and it's about people and it's about engaging those people with the science. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that it's been mentioned a lot through this conference that it's really important that citizen science projects need to be about valid science. 
Um, so two of the most important things to ask yourself when you're setting up a project are what are the scientific outcomes and how can I make achieving them as engaging as possible for the citizens. So the scientific aims need to be real because otherwise you've just got an outreach or a marketing or a publicity activity and that does happen. Um, so think carefully about scientific aims. They need to be valid and achievable through the project. Um, it's best if they're useful and it's essential for engagement that they're understandable and that's something really um, key because it informs how you engage your citizens and how you design your project. So knowing what you're trying to achieve scientifically can really help motivate people. Um, it kind of seems obvious, but it's surprising how often it's overlooked. It's like it's the call to action, the elevator pitch. It's almost the reason for the project being, and it provides the purpose for the project. It also guides the way that you design your project and the marketing around it. So it should be something really simple and basic that you can sum up in one sen sentence, you know, help us do X so we can solve or discover or fix Y. So here it is with Wildlife Spotter, you know, help save threatened species and preserve Australia's iconic wildlife. It's really clear. Um, another design point that I've used to maximise engagement for the, for the online environment is a really low barrier to entry. So you can see there, start classifying, you can get into it straight away. And here's the same with Galaxy Explorer. Um, classify a galaxy far, far away. Take a trip to some of the furthest reaches of our universe to help Australian scientists understand how galaxies grow and evolve. So instantly, people know what is required of them and why. And the why is really, really important. So my experience um, is in producing online interactive citizen science projects and one thing I always keep in mind is that people come into these projects from anywhere and they don't necessarily have any background at all in what we're talking about or even any level of education. So I spend ages literally thinking about the flow of the project from the point of view who has someone who is someone who has literally no idea of what's going on. Um, yeah, one of my personal and somewhat un-PC expressions is to never underestimate the stupidity of the audience, but I'm telling you that, so don't tell anyone else. But <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's, I mean, it sounds awful, but it's really just a way of expressing, it's like a kind thought, really, about making sure that anybody who, um, who, who doesn't know anything can actually participate in the projects. And it's really about taking it back to basics. Um, does everyone know what a login button is? Like they do today, but they didn't used to. And so we had to be really clear in the past, even the registration process for these projects had to be very simple. Now it doesn't have to because everyone's used to registering. So it's just about knowing your audience, and I call it audience because I come from a media background, but it's um, knowing your participants and thinking about what the skills that they have and what, what level they're working at. Um, often people who are completely familiar with the science aren't the best people to design their own projects. Why? Because they know it too well. Um, that might be controversial to some of you, I don't know, but sometimes it's really hard to see things when you know so much and you're really deep in it and you know exactly what's going on. Yes, this is um, Another thing that it, it's been really great to hear about all through the conference is how important it is to encourage participation and build that into your project design from the beginning. It really is a no-brainer, um, but it's just it's very important to remember it. So here with Explore the Seafloor, um, we had you know the number of photos identified, the number of citizen scientists, and you could win an underwater camera. We, have, we run competitions to encourage participation. We also have easy ways for schools to get involved as a classroom and for the students to work as individuals or as a class, which is really popular. Um, and very clearly kind of saying the sea urchins, that's completed now, so making sure that we're keeping track of things and providing feedback to people all along the way. Um, with Weather Detective, it's also, you know, why we need your help down there, explaining um, down the bottom, you know, how to get involved. Again, the number of observations. 
And that was actually the number of observations recorded, not the number of pages done, because on each page there are about 30 observations. Um, so we wanted to make it as rewarding as possible for people to, to see the numbers go up. And you could also see when you logged on as yourself how many you'd done. Um, again, we offered a prize, which I thought was really funny because it was a tablet. At the time, iPads were sort of fairly new and exciting. Now that probably wouldn't be, but it just kind of, you know, it was like a, it's like a new version of a ship's log.